Welcome to Realcast, the weekly roundup of the real asset markets. My name is Richard Betts and I'm joined by our regular team of Nicole Dines, Dan Innes and Paul Strome. Nicole, let's start with you. What have you been following? Well, Real Asset Media had a, a briefing, an in-depth look at the CE student housing market, which is uh, very promising. Uh, student housing has shown to be a pretty resilient sector in general in Europe this year. Um, around 75% of investors in the sector have said they want to invest more capital despite uh, the difficulties of the pandemic. And uh, But in the CE, the percentage is over 90%. And it's also reflected in the occupancy rate, which has been between 80 and 90% in Europe, in Western Europe but it's been between 90 and 95 percent with peaks of 98 percent in in ce so demand is uh, is very strong and we've seen that also we did a survey of delegates at the briefing and zero percent not one person cited demand as a possible challenge in investing in student housing in ce they cited economic feasibility lack of opportunities rent levels and financing but demand is regarded by universally regarded as incredibly incredibly strong um there are lots of uh, interesting developments in the sector. Um, Poland is seen as the biggest uh, as the biggest country. Not only is it the biggest market, it offers investors scale, but it's also seen as a, a kind of Germany because it's of this polycentric nature. It has many, it's not just Warsaw, but it has many um, very reputable and famous universities, lots of smaller towns. So it offers investors um, scale as well as uh, geographical diversification in the same country. Um, so that's the, the sort of by far the favorite market, but others are interesting as well. Armand Porter of Basecamp students said that he's in, very happy to be in Poland and they're looking at Czech Republic, but they will not go into Hungary or other places because of political concerns. Um, but yet there are developments there as well. And Fuzan University, a Shanghai-based university, has announced that it will open a big campus in Budapest, which is going to be being mentioned as a game changer for, for the country, for Hungary. So while... Uh, for example, Coventry University has opened a campus in Poland. You know, a Chinese university would be the very first one uh, to, to open a, a campus in the, in the EU. So there's a lot of things happening in that sector. Yeah, it was really interesting just to see um, the focus as well on international students potentially coming to Poland, um, not just from, from the EU, but also outside of the EU within Europe. Dan, what have you been following? In the UK, we've passed another checkpoint on the roadmap out of coronavirus restrictions. But in real estate, there's been major investment news from across the channel. Um, it was announced that Bearings, the global investment manager, they've acquired a logistics development opportunity near Paris from a private investor. When completed, the development is going to be about 24,000 square metres and split into six units. Um, bearings, they're, you know, in addition to Germany and France, they've been targeting markets in Italy, Spain, the Netherlands and the Nordics. And you know, with their last deal signed late in 2020, that French logistics portfolio now comprises nine assets um, at, at around 300 million euros. So that, that's welcome news for a market that's characterised by a sort of a shortage of refurbished space. Um, but there is a robust demand for urban logistics and light industrial. Um, and on that very topic, uh, in the UK, US investor Ardent has announced that its UK business completed a cash deal to acquire two logistics portfolios and two off-market properties from M7 uh, real estate. Uh, that was for £55.2 million. Pounds. And that, that marked their first acquisition in the UK. Meanwhile, the UK's government... They've announced new planning laws uh, this week that allow commercial buildings to be converted into homes. And that came into force on Friday. And that was all part of measures to revive high streets and town centres. That's something uh, Mark Robinson uh, and the High Street Task Force will be undoubtedly supporting. The new rules, they also apply to extensions to public service buildings like schools, hospitals, universities. It supports a series of recent measures uh, introduced to help high streets recover once lockdown restrictions are lifted. And that was the £56 million Welcome Back Fund. Uh, it includes the relaxation of planning rules to allow pubs and restaurants to operate as takeaways and longer opening hours for retail to give shoppers more flexibility in ease transport congestion. They, shops can now open from 7am to 10pm. Sticking with, with retail, this week bakery chain Greg's has announced it's going to open its first drive through outlet in Wales this summer, following the success of a handful of different pilots uh, for the format in England. 
where the contracts have been exchanged and the shop is going to open in July in Swansea. So uh, time for a vegan sausage roll or maybe a Welsh cake, Richie. Thanks, Dan. I'm sure a number of the people will be uh, grateful to Greg's as the UK granularly uh, comes out of lockdown. Um, but picking up on the logistics sector, um, I was watching the stock markets and CTP launched on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange in what was seen as a very successful IPO, which raised 854 million euros. This is an addition to the 500 million raised by their third green bond. Um, and CTP have been very active also with plans to invest 200 million in Slovakia, 300 million in the Netherlands, and announced earlier in the year that 100% of their 292 buildings across six countries were Brian very good or higher. And it's interesting to compare this um, to the London IPO of Deliveroo, which saw the company mark down two billion um, in one of the worst market debuts on record. And it was shunned by a number of the big investors, including Aviva, because of concerns over workers' rights, with David Cumming, chief investment officer at Aviva, highlighting that social responsibilities are now taken a lot more seriously by investors. And it's interesting just to see how the social aspects of ESG are really beginning to come through more strongly now. Paul, what have you been following? In the retail sector, uh, again, uh, retail's obviously been one of the hardest hit sectors in the pandemic, and the European Council of Shopping Places has, has released a position paper that's been prompted by the financial effects of COVID-19. It says the uncertainty of repeated lockdowns, inconsistent approach of different governments, and the overly onerous focus on retail landlords to support an industry in crisis is, is not sustainable. It says landlords across Europe are dealing with the economic consequences of significant drops in footfall, rent collection and uh, increased costs, but with very little financial help or support. The ECSP paper calls on relevant authorities to urgently consider a series of measures uh, to mitigate the impact. And uh, these include things such as reviewing financial covenants, increased financial uh, and banking flexibility, adopting a more holistic approach to subsidies where the burden is shared, uh, and some basic rules on property tax uh, with more lines of credit for retailers. Also, off offices have clearly been affected by the lockdowns too. And we've been told that investors are focusing on core until we know what the new normal will be. However, in one of Real Asset Insights thought leader interviews this week, Christina Ofshonka, Managing Director of Fund Management at uh, AEW, pointed out that the definition of core might not be so straightforward now. She said there's a need to ask and to understand in more detail why an asset is capable of generating strong demand and whether it can do so beyond current tendencies. The new need for ESG compliance has further complicated the issue uh, of ensuring assets are future-proof and asset managers now need to be a lot more active. She also said that long-term sectors that have been perceived as the most liquid or safe havens will not continue to be defined that way by default. Uh, logistics and residential likely to continue to be seen as lower risk. Uh, office and retail will find a new equilibrium, but perhaps with uh, higher yields. She does point out, though, that with all these changes come uh, opportunities. Uh, and lastly, there's a tendency to think of US capital heading for Europe, but there was another reminder this week that's not all one-way traffic. When Roundhill Capital announced that it has acquired a large uh, multifamily apartment community in Dallas, Texas, the acquisition was made on behalf of their US Residential Income and Growth Fund. The asset is called Cortland Allen Station, and it was acquired when uh, USRIG held an additional closing uh, which attracted new capital from an unnamed uh, leading European institutional investor. Roundhill said the fund's proving attractive to European investors who uh, like stability of multifamily assets in high growth southern US markets. Roundhill said the current economic climate is encouraging European institutional investors to shift capital towards defensive real estate assets. That theme of capital flows also came up in an interview with Sushila Rivers of DLA Piper, just saying that improved capital raising and a greater focus on technology and ESG could be positive consequences coming out of the COVID crisis, but also that there's a positive outlook for Asia and a sense that global capital flows will return and that China may take a leading role, particularly looking towards the Greater Bay Area and the investments around the life sciences sector there. Thanks very much, Dan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again next week for our regular roundup of the week in real assets. Thank you. Thank you.